Radhe Radhe Govinda Govinda Radhe 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 Govinda Govinda Radhe 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 Following a lecture given at the Suva Civic Center in the Fiji Islands, several questions were posed of the speaker, Srila Tamal Krishna Goswami, covering the topics of philosophy and religion. My question is, uh, I want to question the originals of uh, human beings. In other words, where do human beings originate from? Very good question. Uh, the uh, origin of human beings, or we should say the origin of all forms of life, because according to the Vedas, uh, there are a total of 8,400,000 different species of life, of which 400,000 are human, uh, 900,000 are aquatics, that means uh, water creatures, uh, one million types of birds, two million types of uh, trees and plants, and three million types of four-legged animals. So of all of this, eight million four hundred thousand, four hundred thousand of them are humans. Now all of these different forms are produced by the uh, material nature. Uh, this material nature uh, or three gunas uh, uh, is working under the control of God. Uh, originally, everyone is from the spiritual world or the kingdom of God. There in the kingdom of God, uh, all souls originally live. But each one of these souls has a minute degree of independence or freedom. And that freedom, if it's properly used, uh, is used in the service of God, where one continues to serve the Lord in the spiritual world or kingdom of God. However, due to the infinitesimal small size of the soul, sometimes an individual may misuse his freedom or independence and want to try to uh, compete or lord it over the energy of the Lord and thus try to take the place of God. So for such rebellious souls, they are sent into this material world. This material world is compared to be just like a prison house. Uh, although we all feel ourselves to be quite free, actually it is not the fact because at every moment we are bounded by the laws of birth and death. No one can free himself from this cycle of repeated birth and death unless he learns to abide by the law of God. One who abides by the law of God, he becomes released from this prison house and so is able to transfer himself, the soul, back to the kingdom of God from whence he came. This uh, transfer of the soul is accomplished by a change in consciousness which is very easily affected by the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra. So Hare Krishna mantra means to free the soul you see, from its enviousness. Our problem is that we have become envious of God. Instead of wanting to serve God, we all want to be served ourselves as God. Therefore man thinks himself to be the lord of his home, or the master of his business, or the master of his nation. Everyone is trying to lord it over the material energy and no one is willing to take a humble position and be the servant of the Lord. Therefore, one has to give up this envious mentality. That has been described by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, that one should take up the mood, 
One should become more humble than a blade of grass, more tolerant than a tree, not asking for any respect for oneself, but being willing to give all respect to others. In such a mentality, one can constantly praise and glorify the Supreme. So anyone who takes up the process of chanting Hare Krishna will find himself becoming free from this enviousness of God and feeling himself to be more and more the humble servant of God. When one gets that mentality back, his original nature, then automatically at the end of this life, the Supreme Lord will take that person back to the kingdom of God. We are all human beings. Why we have different kinds of religions and races in this world? Right. The answer is actually there's only one religion. Love of God. But according to time, place and circumstance, God has to teach this one religion in many different ways. Just like during the time of Lord Jesus Christ, people were living in the desert, in that area of the world where he took his appearance, and they were very much sinful, very sinful. If you see the things that he had to do, you'll understand they were very sinful. So in that place where he was preaching, for the little bit that he taught, what did they do? They crucified him. That's for the little teaching for three years, he got crucified. Now you try to think, is, are these people such advanced devotees or knowers of God, that the Son of God comes and tries to save them, and their, and their thank you is, now we will crucify you. And no, that wasn't just the general view. His best disciples, the apostles, they all denied him. Try to understand the difficulty that Jesus Christ faced. Not only the general population were completely fallen, practically nomadic wanderers, but his best men denied him. Now how much do you think he could teach? Therefore you'll find that he teaches in a very simple way. God is great. God is the Father. His name is hallowed. Everyone should serve him. But he can't go into much detail. You'll find in the Bible the statement that there are things which I have not yet spoken to you. It is mentioned. Because the little that he did speak, they had to, they crucified him for. This is one religion, Christianity. In the Muslim faith, Prophet Muhammad dealing with very difficult circumstances. In the, in the Quran it's mentioned one should not have sex with one's mother. Now you try to understand the nature of the people that Prophet Muhammad was dealing with. He had to tell them, don't have sex with your mother. Or what kind of man is that? Just like Jesus had to remark, don't, don't kill. That means he's dealing with killers. Unless someone is a killer or a murderer, why you tell him, don't kill? You don't have to tell me that, because I'm not a killer. I already know that. In fact, you'll find that Krishna's teachings are given to very exalted persons. The Vedas, for example, were spoken to the gathering, like Srimad Bhagavatam, was spoken to the gathering of the sages at Namaisharanya. These saintly persons were so advanced in spiritual life that they gathered for 1,000 years just to perform religious rites for the well-being of the whole world. And their assembly was so exalted that they didn't sleep, just like Harikat Maharaj didn't sleep, he didn't eat for seven days in a row. He was so advanced in spiritual life. He was simply interested in God realization. So among such great exalted saintly persons, all the detailed knowledge of God can be revealed. Therefore you'll find in the Vedas not only that God is great, but how great is God? What does God look like? Where is He? Who is He with? What is going on in the kingdom of God? All of these things are being described. Therefore we find that actually uh, the Vedas are said to be, or the Vedic knowledge is said to be the postgraduate science of God realization. Postgraduate science means 
that it is the uh, ultimate teaching in God-realization. Uh, ultimately, of course, all of these religions are teaching the same message. Love God with all thy heart and all thy soul. This is a basic teaching. How far a religion helps you to develop love of God, that will determine how good the religion is. And how will we know? We have to test by the results. How do you tell a tree? By the fruit the tree bears. So we have to see the different followers of religions and make a comparative study. How absorbed are they in materialistic activities or how free are they from materialistic activities? Then we will know who is actually advanced and which religion is first class. So this is the way to test. You test the adherence of a religion to know how good the religion is. Uh, is this is a question on Jesus Christ. According to the Tibetan lamas, that Christ, when he was a young man, he came to India and Tibet and he was taught by the masters there. And at the age of 30, they told him to go back to the Middle East where he was born and start teaching there since the Hindus and Buddhists Buddhist live the perfect life as thought. Could you please elaborate on that? Uh, there is evidence to support that Jesus uh, may have gone to India for his studies. And it is said that that's why in the Bible from the ages of 12 to 30 there is no description given of his activities. It is said, for example, that he went to the city of Benares where he learned the art of healing because as you're probably aware of, this art of healing is not a very uh, unknown art. In fact, it is current even today among certain advanced yogis. It is a yogic method by which you can heal a person simply by uh, various either applying of hand or sound vibration or various other mantras. And he, in other places he also learned many mystical arts. In any case, uh, uh, the real point is that the various types of things like the art of healing and other things are not the real display of Jesus Christ's greatness. His real greatness is that he taught love of God. The unfortunate point is that nowadays, in the name of Jesus Christ, people don't follow his instructions seriously enough. If they would do that, then this world would be a much better world to live in. So our movement, Krishna Consciousness Movement, is not discouraging the worship of Jesus Christ because we accept him as the Son of God. But we encourage people, why don't you follow his instructions? Actually, for anyone who studies our movement, you will uh, I'm sure, find that we are amongst the most true Christians in the whole world because we follow very strictly all the Ten Commandments which are listed in the Bible. Uh, however, I have seen so many people uh, in the name of Christ commit so many sinful activities on the plea that Christ has made contract for dying to save them for their sins. But this type of understanding of Jesus Christ is most unfortunate. Christ gave his life to redeem the fallen persons. But it doesn't mean that you continue to sin. It means that if you are a sinner and you stop your sinnings, then you become saved. But if one goes on sinning, what type of religion is this? That every Sunday you come and profess or confess your sins and then Monday through Saturday one repeats the sins all over. Such a person can never be worthy of God's grace. To become worthy of one's God's grace one has to stop sinning. So the first commandment is thou shalt not kill. But unfortunately uh, so-called Christians uh, are committing so much killing all the time by killing helpless animals and eating their flesh. Now it is understood that the Bible is going to be changed for, uh, as it has been changed many times in the past, it's again going to be changed, and this time they're going to change the first commandment to thou shalt not murder, which will give everybody the full license to kill as many animals as they want and not be breaking the commandment. So such tricks will not actually save one from committing sins, and such killers 
not just of humans, but of any living entity. Such killers will never be able to enter the kingdom of God. So our request to anyone uh, who follows or who calls himself a follower of Christ, do you kindly follow his teachings strictly? Otherwise, in the name of Jesus Christ, don't go on committing sins and using the Lord's Son of the Lord's name. This is a very grievous mistake, that in the name of Christ, you commit all kinds of nonsense activities and call yourself a Christian. Better to admit that you're not a genuine Christian than to use Christ's name and go on sinning in so many ways. Anyone who follows strictly uh, the uh, commandments of the Bible will certainly go back to the kingdom of God. But so far we find that even the leaders you see, of so many religions, they themselves can't strictly follow anymore. I, I many times have called upon to give lectures in various seminaries and other places where there are large gatherings of either uh, ministers or priests or those who are studying for the priesthood or ministry. And they are astounded to see that we, for example, don't watch television. Of course, in this country, there's no problem. There is no television. But in America, there is television. We don't watch television. We don't smoke. We don't uh, gamble. We don't take any intoxication, including tea or coffee or even, uh, as I said, cigarettes. We don't have any type of illicit sex. Even in amongst our married people, sex life is only uh, engaged for having children. You see, not otherwise. Uh, so there's very strict uh, uh, adherence to spiritual principles. And they're amazed because I find that more and more the ministers, the priests and others are engaging in so many activities which Jesus Christ would never have engaged in. I can't imagine Jesus Christ smoking a cigarette. It's ridiculous to even think of the thing. I can't imagine him wasting his time watching television or reading the daily newspapers. Because his whole teaching is to love thy Lord with all thy heart and soul. Not 70% or 80%, but all, 100% of one's time. The same teaching is given in Gita by Krishna. Man mana bhava mad bhakto mad yaji mam namashkuru mamei vaishyashi satyam tayi prati jana upyoshi me. You should engage your mind always in thinking of me, he says. You should become, or you should offer everything unto me. You should offer your sacrifices unto me. Uh, you should do everything for me. Everything that you eat, you should first offer to me. This means 100% God consciousness. Not 70% God consciousness and 30% going to movies, 30% watching television, 30% smoking cigarettes, 30% engaging in illicit sex and so many other nonsense, mundane activities. So our point is not that we're trying to say, look at us, we're the only great devotees of God. But at least we can actually say we're following the teachings of God. We're the first ones to be very glad to see someone else doing it. But in the name of being a servant of God, so many material activities are being engaged upon, and we have to call a spade a spade. We have to say, this is nonsense. Stop using the name of God. Stop using the name of God, and in the name of God, committing so many offenses. Now, there are thousands in India today who believe in a saint to be a reincarnation of Lord Krishna. The reincarnation himself has not predicted, has never predicted that he is a reincarnation of Lord Krishna, but the devotees are predicting that he is a reincarnation. I would last like to ask you whether it is true that the present saint who, whose uh, teachings are basically from the Bhagavad Gita is a true incarnation of Lord Sri Krishna? Uh, who, I don't know who you're speaking of. Could you first tell me? He is uh, Sri Satya Sai Baba, okay. known as Bhagwan Sri Satya Sai Baba. All right. As I mentioned earlier, the incarnation of God uh, is mentioned. Krishna says, His appearance comes once in every day of Brahma. Once in every day of Brahma, I have already described, Brahma lives for 1,000 times 4,320,000 years. And Krishna comes in the 28th millennium during that one day 
of Brahma. This is one day of Brahma, not the full lifetime. So Krishna came 5,000 years ago. So his next scheduled incarnation as Krishna will not be again for a very, very long time. However, in Srimad Bhagavatam, the, all the genuine incarnations of God are listed. Uh, the next incarnation listed after Lord Krishna is the incarnation of Buddha. Lord Buddha's place of appearance, Gaya, is mentioned. His father and mother's name is also mentioned. And his activities are also mentioned. After Lord Buddha, the next incarnation which is mentioned is Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who is described, Krishna Vana Trisha Krishna Sangho Pangashta Parshadam Yajnai Sankirtanai Prayer Yajantihi Sumedasha In this Kali Yuga, the Lord will advent himself in a golden color accompanied by his associates and will dance and chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. The next incarnation after Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is Kalki Avatar, who comes at the end of Kali Yuga in approximately 427,000 more years. Now between Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Kalki Avatar, no other incarnation is mentioned in scripture. So this is one point, that uh, the person who you have mentioned, at least he's not mentioned anywhere in scripture, is his appearance. His father and mother are not mentioned, his place of birth are not mentioned, neither his activities. I'm just going to give you, this is the way you can understand who is an incarnation of God. You see, because I, anybody can call themselves an incarnation or anybody can have others who may call themselves. But we have to know what the scientific or shastric method for recognizing the incarnation of God is. This is all I'm, I want to point out. First point is that in shastras there's no mention of this person coming. Second thing is, as I said to you, the incarnations of God have special physical markings on their bodies. For instance, you will know that Krishna had various markings on his lotus feet. He had the uh, club, he had the disc, and various other different bodily markings by which to recognize him. So do every other incarnation. For example, in one of the incarnations of God known as Prithu Maharaj, as soon as he appeared, all the sages could immediately understand he was a genuine incarnation because of these bodily markings. However, the personality you have mentioned has never ex described and never has it shown. I'm giving you various points to, by which you can understand who is an incarnation. The next way that you can understand a person is an incarnation of God is by his extraordinary activities. Extraordinary activities mean, for example, Krishna lifted Govardhan Hill for seven days and seven nights with one finger. Krishna, when he appeared here, was able to uh, duplicate himself 16,000 times simultaneously and be present in the same different places simultaneously, you see. And this is another display of his opulence. Another point is that Krishna didn't use the words of someone else, he spoke Bhagavad Gita. He didn't quote somebody else, he spoke Bhagavad Gita. So he demonstrated his all-knowing aspect. So these are various ways that we can understand who is a genuine incarnation. You see. Bhagavan, what does Bhagavan mean? Bhagavan means who is the most beautiful. And everyone will accept that person as the most beautiful. Not only a few thousand people or, or a few million people even. Everyone will realize his beauty. Therefore Krishna is described as Madan Mohan. What does Madan Mohan mean? It means the bewilderer of Cupid. His beauty is so great that thousands, Kandar Pakoti, Kamini Abhishesha Shobham, Rolindamadi Purusham Tamaham Bajami. Thousands and hundreds of thousands of Cupids are swooning at the beauty of God. That's how beautiful he is. Not that his beauty is covered and only some people can recognize him. His strength is unlimited. Krishna is known as Bala, Balaram. Balaram is his brother. He's the expansion of Krishna. And he holds up in this form as Ananda Shesh all of the universes. This is Krishna. Simultaneously he could defeat hundreds of thousands of soldiers. This is Lord Krishna. There's unlimited pastimes if you've read Srimad Bhagavatam of Lord Krishna. And who has, who has accepted Krishna? All of the greater charges have accepted him. Not some millions of people who don't know Shastra, but greater charges have accepted him on the basis of Shastra. They could understand who is actually God and who is pretending to be God. It's clearly stated that Ramanuja Charger, he worships Krishna. 
He's the, you may understand, he's the Acharya of the Ramanuja Sampradaya. Madhva Acharya, the, the Acharya of Madhva Sampradaya. He worships Krishna. Vishnu Swami, he worships Krishna. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, even Shankar Acharya says, Vajra Govinda, Vajra Govinda. He worships Krishna. So this is not the uh, speculation of someone. Brahma, Lord Brahma, the first person in the universe, says, Govinda Mahadi Purusham, Tamaham Bajami. He's worshipping Krishna. All of the great demigods, they're worshipping Krishna. Now please tell me how it is that you can say that someone suddenly appears and because he's speaking some verses, it is comp amazing to me. Is there anywhere in the scriptures that his name, his father and mother's name, and the place of his birth is, is mentioned? No, as far as, according to my knowledge, there is no mention about Sai Baba's name nor his parents. Okay. Next question is, are there any markings on his feet or hands which indicate him to be an incarnation of God? This is what I, have, I haven't personally witnessed, but there uh, is a story about Sai Baba having some sort of marking. Having some sort of marking. Have, have you gone there? Yeah. yeah, so you've gone there. Have you seen any markings? I mean, I have, have seen pictures. Have I you seen marking? That marking doesn't mean lines on the hand, sir. I have not seen any marking, markings, right, but right. I've seen certain miracles performed now, by him. that's the next question I'm going to ask of you. That so far you've answered that you have... That's all right. So far you have answered that his not, he's not mentioned so far that you know in scripture. Neither he has any markings so far you know on his body to indicate him as an incarnate. The next thing, as I mentioned, is by his wonderful activities. So now you are about to tell us some of the miracles which he has performed. So you can describe some of these miracles which make him the supreme God. Please tell us. Well, I have seen certain miracles, uh, miracles performed by Sai Baba in India. India. Yes, I have wit witnessed it with my own eyes. Miracles which have uh, cured people with uh, different uh, types of diseases, particularly for one like cancer. Also that he has uh, materialized uh, certain articles, like uh, certain objects, like what? Uh, religious uh, photographs. A religious photographs. Yes, small statues of uh, Lord Shiva, Statue Lord Ganesha, right? And uh, sacred ashes by the wave of his hand. Just a mere wave, mere wave of his hand, he has ashes, sacred ashes, and he gives it to devotees. Uh, this is what I have personally witnessed. So the first miracle that you mentioned is that uh, he has cured people of cancer. Now I would like to know how many cancer patients have also been cured in hospitals. Is there anyone who ever suffered from cancer who was cured by someone else besides the person you're mentioning. In other words, if there's any doctor who by his treatment has cured patients of cancer, then according to you, that doctor can be called Bhagavan. That's the first point. Whether he does it by his hand or whether he does it by an instrument, I don't think it makes much difference. The real point is that the person got cured of cancer. So now, this means that anyone who can cure someone of cancer is God. This is your, one of your miraculous statements. Another miraculous statement is that he manufactures pictures and uh, deities within his hand. Now I would like to point out to you that these same pictures and deities are available in any shop, in any holy place in India. Now, my point again is that what is the value of the miracle? You see, I, I'll even accept, let us say that we accept that he did manufacture those things in his hand. How valuable is that miracle? In other words, that miracle is as valuable as the value of the picture or murti. Because the same picture or murti happens to be available in a shop, in a holy place, for 10 rupees or 100 rupees, no. Just like gold, for example, I know so many miracles which he is said to have performed. He's said to have uh, shown gold, manufactured gold. How much gold? How much gold? 10,000 bricks of gold? Then it's valuable. But a little lump of gold, I can go to a jeweler shop and purchase it, sir. If that's all you have to do to become God, oh, it's very easy. There must be lots of gods going around the world.
Now, I want to point out that my Guru Dave, my spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada, was asked by some people in India, please, Swamiji, show us some miracles. So he said, I'm showing you a miracle. I'm showing you these boys and girls who were formerly addicted to the most sinful habits in the world. And they have completely given them up and dedicated themselves 100% to the service of Krishna. Now you decide which is the more valuable miracle, to make someone a devotee of God or to give someone some ashes. Which is worth more? I can light a fire here and create heaps of ashes. That doesn't make me God. What difference does it make whether it comes out of my hand or it comes from a match? Ashes are ashes. The value of it is ashes. But God is the controller of everything. Aham sarvasa prabhavo matta sarvam pravartate. He has created all the planets and all of the worlds. This is God. Aham bija prabhatapita. He is the seed giving father of everyone. And he knows the mind of everyone. You should go in front of this person. Let everyone go in front and say, please tell me exactly what's on my mind. He can't do it. I'll guarantee you, he won't know what's on my mind. Because he doesn't have that power. Only the Paramatma, only Paramatma has that power. I say to you, sir, that don't take someone as God just by some cheap miracle. I say cheap because it can be done by anyone who has materialistic powers. You should understand, this is called Siddhi, Yoga Siddhi. Yoga Siddhi means mystic perfection. There are eight mystic perfections and one of them is Prapta Siddhi. Prapta Siddhi means that you can manufacture anything at your own desire. You can bring anything or acquire anything from anywhere at your own will. This is Prapta Siddhi. Every yogi has this city. There's one planet known as Siddhaloka. All the residents of that planet have all of these cities. Not just that, they have Lavima City. They can walk on the sun beams up to the sun planet. That's another one of their cities. They can make themselves lighter than the lightest, heavier than the heaviest. They can create an entire universe. And simply because someone manufactures some little ashes on the ground, you bow down and say, you must be God. Try to understand from Shastra. Don't understand. Your senses are not perfect, sir. This is the nature of material life. The senses are imperfect. There's mistakes, there's illusion, and there's a tendency to become cheated. This is four defects of conditioned life in Kali Yuga. The senses are not perfect. The, uh, there is a tendency to make mistakes. There's, everyone is subject to illusion, and there's a propensity to be cheated and to cheat others. So I have to say to you, sir, that as long as you depend upon your own conditioned intelligence, you're subject to these four defects, and therefore you're making a mistake. But if you are Shastra Chaksu, if you see with the eyes of Shastra or Scripture, you'll make no such mistake. Therefore, when I answer your questions, I don't say, well, I never saw it. It doesn't matter whether I saw these miracles or not. When I hear them, when I hear them, I know this is not God. I understand from Shastra, from Vedas, what God is. Even from Bible, from Quran, from Torah, you can understand who God is. You'll never find anyone in the Bible, in the Quran, in the Torah, or the Bhagavad Gita who manufactures some ashes and is worshipped by people as God. You've got to do a lot more than that. Jesus Christ spoke the teachings of the New Testament. Lord Krishna spoke the teachings of Bhagavad Gita. Now what teachings new has this person spoken? Why doesn't he speak some new teachings? Why he has to depend upon the real God for his teachings? If he's God, let him make his own teachings up. But someone who's not God, he has to depend upon others for the teachings. Therefore he's not God and he should only be understood to be that way. I don't say I'm God, I never would say such a thing. I'm not, I don't even say I'm the servant of God. I'm just trying to be the servant of my spiritual master, my Guru Maharaj. That's all I want to be. This is my dog tag. I'm the dog of my Guru. I don't call myself God. And no one else calls me God. 
No genuine guru ever call himself God. Or let any disciple call himself God. That's a genuine guru. And I'm amazed to see how people can accept someone as God simply for some little magic show. So what if he got cured from cancer? Did he stop him from dying? Then you can say he's Krishna. Because Krishna is known as Makunda, the giver of liberation. Cancer can be cured by any material means. And so can a deity be made. Anyone can make a murti. You just get some metal and pour it in a mold and produce it with some fire. And you can make a murti also. And you can paint pictures. And you can light a fire and get plenty of ashes. But that doesn't make you God. Don't take God so cheaply. God is loitering in the street. Today there's one incarnation. Tomorrow there'll be a hundred incarnations. If there's so many incarnations or he's an incarnation of God, then you answer this question. Why is there so much irreligion all over the world? When Krishna was present on this planet, he destroyed irreligion. There was no irreligion because he killed all the irreligious elements. But I say that every single day in the reign of this new God that you are mentioning, irreligion is increasing more and more and more. Then how you can call him God? God comes to, de to destroy irreligion. Yada yada hi dharmasya. Kvaniya bhavati bharata. Abhyutanama dharmasya. Tadatmanam sijamiyam. He says, I come to restore religion. But I see re irreligion increasing. So how you say he's God? If he's God, why isn't his power destroying all irreligious elements? Instead, he has some millions of people who are bowing down. The blind following the blind. Now your teacher says that he is God, but then why does he sing Krishna bhajans? That means he admits that Krishna is the real God. If he says that he's God, he should sing his own bhajans. But he's singing Krishna bhajan. That means Krishna is actually God. Now how to worship Krishna, that you'll have to learn from the Hare Krishna movement. Because this is the standard movement for teaching how to worship Krishna. We don't have a bunch of followers who worship this God and that God and this Guru and that Guru. Our devotees of the Hare Krishna movement are very clear about who is God. Therefore, they only worship Krishna. They don't follow a little teaching from here and a little teaching from there. This is simply a big hodgepodge. You have so many gods, so many gurus. Upat. Big hodgepodge of different types of worship. This means many roads taking so many paths and getting nowhere. We will take one path straight back to home, back to Godhead. That is our philosophy. I think uh, if the society continues to expose those cults and uh, the leaders of the cults, uh, it could uh, in a way uh, make people realize that they are not uh, supposed to follow blindly those uh, what you call charismatic uh, uh, leaders or uh, spiritual leaders. I would only like to state that uh, since I have been a devotee of Lord Krishna ever since my mother was a devotee, I will still be a devotee of Lord Krishna until I live. And uh, I think in my own conscience there is nothing wrong in being not a devotee of Sai Baba but be a believer in his teachings. Now you say that you worship Krishna as well as Sai Baba and that you've worshipped Krishna since childhood. But one thing you should understand, that when you worship Krishna, then you don't worship anybody else. Because Sri Krishna says, Saradamam Prithyaja, Mame Kam Saranambraja. He says you give up the worship of everyone else and everything else, and you simply worship Him. Being a devotee of Krishna is not such a cheap thing, that you can worship Krishna, worship this God, worship that God, or this Guru and that Guru. You make up your mind. Now, I do thank you once again for giving me the right answer and explaining to me as I have said that I have never said in my conversation that I also had believed in Sai Baba to be a true incarnation of Lord Krishna but as I have said that there are thousands who believe in him as a true incarnation of Lord Krishna this is what my question was now you have given me the right answer and I thank you once again for explaining to me in detail The question I'm directing is, 
to the questioner who just recently questioned you. He is holding the position of secretary of the Satya Sai organization over here. And as such, as such, I think uh, if he has accepted your uh, explanation, he got to resign or uh, leave the organization. Mr. Singh, my request to you tonight is this, that you've been a devotee of Sai Baba for some time. How long, please? How long? How long has that been? How long? How many years? How many years? Okay. You've been a devotee of Sai Baba for eight years. Now my request is this. I request you to become a staunch devotee of Lord Krishna, not for eight years, not for eight years, for eight months. Eight months. And during that time, I request you that you follow the principles taught by Lord Krishna. That means you don't eat meat, fish, or eggs, you don't gamble, you don't take any intoxication and no illicit sex. And every day you chant 16 rounds of Hare Krishna Japa. Now if you will do this for eight months, I say that you will get more blessings, more mercy, more knowledge in those eight months that you will get in 800 years from the present type of worship that you're doing. And the only way that you'll know if I'm right or not is by trying it. And furthermore, I would like to tell you that if you do what I'm saying and you don't find that you get more mercy, more blessings and more knowledge in those eight months, then I stand on record that I will give you a check for $10,000. And I'm making this public declaration here that I will give you a check personally for $10,000 if after eight months of worship of Krishna, you don't find yourself improved in every respect from your present mode of worship. But to answer your question is to be Lord Krishna's devotee for eight months uh, only, I think uh, I would... Uh, only like to say that uh, the, the uh, basic principles which you have just said that uh, to fast on, on certain intervals and on certain items, I think uh, I would try on that and uh, see the difference then. Radhe Radhe Govinda Radhe Radhe Govinda Radhe Radhe Govinda 